This week on the CNET Tech Review, it's all about the iPhone 4, mostly. We've got Steve's big announcement and Brian Tong's hands-on first look from the WWDC. Plus, Safari 5 is released into the wild. And Porsche's four-door sports car fails to make the grade. It's all coming up right now. Hey everyone, I'm Molly Wood and welcome to the CNET Tech Review, the show where we run down the hottest videos of the week and tell you which are good, which are bad, and offer some sage bottom line advice. Let's start with the good. On Monday, Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference opened in San Francisco. Oh, who am I kidding? You just want to see the new iPhone. Well, here you go. For 2010, we're going to take the biggest leap since the original iPhone. And so today, today, we're introducing iPhone 4, the fourth generation iPhone. Now, this is really hot. And there are, there are well over 100 new features, and we don't have time to cover all of them today. So I get to cover eight of them with you. Eight new features of the iPhone 4. The first one, an all new design. Now, stop me if you've already seen this. <laughs> uh, believe me, you ain't seen it. You've got to see this thing in person. It is one of the most beautiful designs you've ever seen. This is, beyond a doubt, the most precise thing, one of the most beautiful things we've ever made. Glass on the front and the rear, and stainless steel running around, and the precision of which this is made is, is beyond any consumer product we've ever seen. It's closest kin is like a beautiful old Leica camera. It's unheard of in consumer products today. Just gorgeous. And it's really thin. This is the new iPhone 4. It is just 9.3 millimeters thick, that is 24% thinner than the iPhone GS. Again, a quarter thinner in something you didn't think could get any thinner. As a matter of fact, it is the thinnest smartphone on the planet. So let me point out, let me point out a few of the things, uh, a few of the external things on it. Here are the volume controls, volume up, volume down, and mute. On the front, we have a front-facing camera. We have the receiver. We have the home button. People have asked, what's this? <laughs> Some have even said, this doesn't seem like Apple. What are these lines in this beautiful stainless steel band? Well, it turns out there's not just one of them. There's three of them. And they are part of the entire structure of this phone. That stainless steel band that runs around is the primary structural element of the phone. And there are these three slits in it. It turns out this is part of some brilliant engineering, which actually uses the stainless steel band as part of the antenna system. And so one piece is Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and GPS, and the other is UMTS and GSM. So it's got these integrated antennas right in the structure of the phone. It's never been done before. Three and a half inches, the same size as the iPhone 3GS, yet with 960 by 640 pixels, that's four times more pixels than the iPhone, G iPhone 3GS. 326 pixels per inch, an 800 to 1 contrast ratio, which is, again, four times better than the 3GS. 
We're using IPS technology. This is a very advanced LCD technology, which is quite a bit, in our opinion, quite a bit better than the OLED technology for these types of products. And uh, provides much more accurate color and much higher resolution. You can't make an OLED display with this type of resolution right now. And so we think the IPS technology is, is really quite superior. And it results in incredibly sharp text, images, and video. And there you have it. A lot of people bummed there wasn't any iPhone on Verizon announcement, including me. But I got to say, that new design, quite nice. Speaking of which, it's one thing to see Steve Jobs demo the new iPhone, but it's a whole different world when you can hold it in your hand and see for yourself. Luckily, Brian Tong was able to do just that so he could bring you this first look. Brian Tong here with CNET.com at WWDC 2010. And here I have two of my new friends. This is the first look at the iPhone 4. We got it in black, we got it in white. Let's just check out some of the killer features of this guy. If you look really closely, we have the front-facing camera. This is what it was all about, FaceTime. The first phone fully integrated with a seamless video chat. What makes it great, it does work over Wi-Fi only right now in 2010. They're going to work with the carriers to make that happen in the future, hopefully over 3G. We'll probably see it over 4G networks. But what you also have here is the ability to use the camera on the back side so that they can see what you're seeing. And this phone here was all about the camera. It's a 5 megapixel still camera with an LED flash. It also takes HD video at 720p, 30 frames per second. And then when you add all that together, you have the ability to get their application, iMovie for the iPhone, instantly enables you to edit video with themes, transitions, take picture assets, music assets, as well as transitions, and make a polished video all on this little device. Now we also know it's a really slim form factor. This is 9.3 millimeters, the slimmest smartphone to date. And some unique features here is its stainless steel frame. Now this frame, what makes a difference is that they've actually built technology into it that allows to serve as the antenna. So not only is it the structure for the phone, but you can get signals through your 3G, your Bluetooth, and your Wi-Fi. This is the antenna. Now another feature you guys may not really be able to see is its retina display. So if you compare it to the original iPhone or the iPhone 3GS, the pixels on here are four times the amount in a one inch square. You'll get super sharp images and text here, looks super clean, but this is one of those things that you really just have to hold in your hand, hold it up next to another iPhone and see to believe. One thing you really didn't expect to see and it wasn't on this iPhone is 4G compatibility. This is still a 3G phone that will be operating on AT&T's network. And for all you AT&T current iPhone users, if your contract expires in 2010, you have the ability to upgrade to this phone without paying any early termination fees. So here's the breakdown. These come in black and white, cool, sexy colors. The 16 gig models are 199. The 32 gig models are 299. They'll be available in five countries, US included on June 24th, and then worldwide sometime in September. So there you have it, a first look at the new iPhone 4. I'm Brian Tom from CNET.com. That's right, June 24th and pre-orders June 15th, coming soon. And of course, once the iPhone 4 hits the streets, our crack team of editors will put it through its paces. Until then, you can head to CNETV.com to see more highlights from Steve Jobs' WWDC keynote and all of our iPhone 4 coverage. In other Apple news, the new iPhone isn't the only thing the company showed us this week. The latest version of the Safari browser was rolled out too, and Jason Parker has a first look for you. Alongside all the news this week about the iPhone 4, Apple released a major upgrade to their flagship web browser. Safari 5 is now available for download, and Apple has added a lot of feature enhancements to be excited about. I'm Jason Parker from CNET Downloads, and this is a first look at Apple's Safari 5 web browser. Though there is a laundry list of changes and fixes in Safari, in this first look we'll be focusing on some of the more major enhancements to the browser. Most features we'll talk about are available across both the Mac and Windows versions of Safari 5. To start off, Safari Reader lets you view articles on the web without distraction, letting you get to the heart of a story without a lot of added noise. When surfing the web, Safari automatically detects if you're reading an article and displays a reader icon in the Smart Address field. By clicking on the reader icon, you'll be able to look at an article in one continuous distraction-free view, graying out annoying ads. On-screen controls let you email, print, and zoom, and your zoom preferences will be remembered for the next article. Possibly as part of Apple's drive to make HTML5 the standard across all web browsers, 
Safari 5 comes with a slew of tweaks to provide even more support for interactive content and media experiences that don't require third-party plugins. With this latest update, you'll now be able to view HTML5 video in full screen and view closed captions where available with the click of a button. Another new feature in Safari 5 is the addition of Microsoft's Bing Search to the list of search engines you can access from the Safari search bar. For a search specific to Bing, simply click on the magnifying glass icon in the search field and select Bing from the list. From there, just type in your search term for results from Bing. One of the long-awaited capabilities of Safari 5 is not very first-look video friendly, but is certainly worth talking about. Apple has finally introduced Safari Extensions, a way for developers to create plugins that will enhance your browsing experience. This means that third-party developers will be able to use HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript to create enhancements like toolbars and custom buttons in your browser. Apple says their extension builder will make it easy for developers to create packages of their extensions for easy distribution and installation. Judging from the success of Firefox extensions, we look forward to what developers will come up with. Overall, with the big feature changes we've talked about here, along with a dramatic performance boost, enhancements to the smart search field, tab settings improvements, hardware acceleration for the Windows version, and much more, Safari 5 is easy to recommend for fans and worthy of checking out if you haven't used Safari before. I'm Jason Parker from CNET Downloads, and this has been a first look at Apple Safari 5. Thanks for watching. Dang it! Even when I tried to change the subject, Jason's demo still slips in stuff about the iPhone. And look who wrote it, Jason Parker. Sneaky. All right, let's take a break while I figure out how to avoid mentioning the iPhone 4 anymore. But don't go anywhere. There's lots of bad stuff still to come. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, your weekly digest of all things good and bad from CNET TV. And on that note, guess what? It's time for the bad. You'd think when a Porsche showed up in the CNET garage, the car tech guys would be tripping over each other to get the chance to drive it. Well, if you're Brian Cooley and the Porsche is the new Panamera, think again. It's the other car they said Porsche would never build. A four-door hatchback, the Panamera. So while we wait for Ferrari to launch a minivan, let's jump in this guy and check the tech. You know, everyone told me Panamera looks better in person. And everyone lied. This is not a pretty car, I'm sorry. Now, the color scheme's not doing it any favors. Uh, candy apple green over infant barf beige. Hmm. But even silver over black, this thing would still look like Porsche gave George Barris a 911 and said, go make a kooky custom that looks pregnant. And he did. Let's get inside. Now, I gotta tell you, I love what Porsche's done with the interior layout. This is some really fresh thinking. Uh, this kind of rising center console here with a little bit stylized and a lot of, but very useful buttons. And look around the cabin. This is a big deal with this car. Four full sporting buckets. This is part of Porsche's thing saying this is truly a sports car with four seats, which we'll have to figure out. Let's get down to the technology now. The car comes standard with a hard drive-based navigation system, and you can look at different views. We have the 3D bird's eye there. I can also switch that to your standard plan view. And the map can also be echoed into this very 007-ish round display to the right of the tachometer. We have an optional media interface. You're going to hear me say optional a lot on this car. That gives us a standard aux, a USB jack, and a proprietary connector for this pigtail that goes to, in this case, an iPod and another male USB for other devices. Now, let's say you want better audio. Go for the Bose 5.1 surround. We have that in this car. That bumps the power to 585 watts, gives you 14 speakers, nine discrete channels of amplification. If you want to really go nuts, get the Burmester audio system for about $6,000. I hadn't heard of these guys before. I'm probably butchering their name, but it's German high-end audio. Now, put this guy in reverse, and let's see our rear view camera. <laughs> oh, that's right. We forgot to get that option added. Yes, it's a $94,000 car, and you have to add the rear view camera. Hmm. We do have sensors. Those were optional, too. Now, all of these 4S Panameras come with a sport mode right here. 
If you bump it up to a little more aggressive level, optionally, you get Sport Plus as part of the Chrono package. There's the Chrono up there on the dash. This button here is interesting, a little nod to efficiency. This is the auto off thing that a lot of Europeans are doing now. If you want the engine to stop when you come to a red light or a stop sign, you leave this thing engaged. In other words, turn that off. And this thing will turn off when you stop. Then you lift off the brake pad, it'll restart the engine. You know, it's kind of hybrid greeny weeny stuff. And of course, there's the chronograph as part of the Sport Chrono package, because, you know, you're going to take your four door hatchback to the track a lot. Give me a break. Oh, while we're talking about silly, check out the key. Shaped like a little Panamera with a great big hood emblem. Now back, the thing you got to deal with is the oh sweet Jesus has got a hatchback moment. Yeah, it sure does. But behind there, not bad. It'll hold a lot. Like you could probably park a 911 back there or enough cash to gas up your Cayenne once. Now being an S car, we've got a 4.8 liter V8 in this guy, naturally aspirated. This one's got 400 horsepower, 369 foot pounds of torque, which even in this day and age are pretty stout numbers. Zero to 60 happens in 4.8 seconds. Pretty good for a big boy. 4.6 if you get that sport chrono package because that adds some launch control. You can really hammer it off the line. MPG is pretty good, 1624. And the emissions numbers are all right too, five and five for greenhouse gas and CO2 on a scale of 10. Okay, so 4.8 liters and 400 horsepower and four driven wheels and two clutches later, what does the Panamera drive like? Well, this 4S drives real well. You got to remember, you're in a longish four-door sedan that doesn't feel like it's got as much wheelbase as it appears from the outside. I'm not forgiving it for being ugly, but when you're sitting up here in the front, you don't look at the stuff behind you or outside, and it feels like you're driving a 911 you can pick up folks in. That's pretty cool. Power comes on for days, and this PDK, when you're pressing the car, is great. It's around town where things get a little annoying. It has a habit of being a little janky when you're, you know, in downtown traffic, coming to starts and stops, and it kind of goes gajunk when it disengages sometimes. It's not a problem, it's just inelegant. Where it is a problem, is on some of the hills here in San Francisco trying to start from a stop on a steep upward grade. And for some reason, this thing sometimes forgets it has gears. I'm not the first reviewer who's had that problem, so they got something to iron out in that situation. A Panamera 4S starts at almost 95 grand. Then to get it CNET style, you'll be optioning for days. USB aux iPod is 440. Keyless access, 1100. Parking sensors, 600. Rear view camera, 650 on top of them. The Bose audio is 1440, but the Burmester audio system is 5700. And that's just a small slice of the options available. Unfortunately, one of them is not different sheet metal. Well, I guess the good news is that once you get on the road, this Porsche drives like a Porsche. But let's be honest, isn't the whole point of driving one of those to look good doing it? I mean, personally, I don't think it looks that bad, except for the green. Yeah, no, that's pretty bad. In other bad news, many of us spend much more time staring at little screens on our desks than big screens on our walls. Eric Franklin is our resident computer monitor expert, and this week he's got a first look at a new SyncMaster from Samsung and a bit of a complex. Hey guys, this is Eric Franklin from CNET.com, and today I'm taking a first look at the very affirmative sounding Samsung SyncMaster P2450H. I think it's the P that really gives it its manly oomph. Actually, it's kind of intimidating with that P in front of it. For the purposes of this video, and so I don't feel like less of a man, more than I already do, I'll simply refer to it as the 2450. With the 2450, Samsung forgoes height adjustment, pivot, and swivel options. However, you can tilt the monitor back 15 degrees. The display is moderately wobbly when you knock it from the sides, and you can easily knock it over when the panel is tilted. However, when the panel is at 90 degrees, we don't believe it's in much danger of toppling. The display has VGA, DVI, and HDMI connection options. However, they're nestled into this alcove, making it frustrating when connecting or disconnecting cables. 
For going buttons, Samsung includes touch areas and denotes each with a small white dot. The actual button labels appear as if they're floating 3D-like within the glass. The on-screen display, or OSD, includes seven presets and typical brightness, contrast, and sharpness controls. In movies, we notice a definite green push in the display, resulting in character faces looking greenish and sickly. This issue also makes the daytime environments look less natural than they did on the Samsung PX2370, for example. The 2450 also crushes dark gray so that certain details in movies can't be seen, whereas on the PX2370, the details are clearly noticeable. Games don't look as vibrant or as graphically impressive as on the PX2370, thanks once again to that green push. If you're debating whether to buy the $260 2450 or the more expensive PX2370, we suggest you pay the extra money for the latter and save yourself some buyer's remorse-induced headaches. Samsung shows some flair with the display's on-screen display button array. However, overall, the display is neither as sexy as a PX2370, nor can it compete with its performance. We recommend that you skip the P2450H. For more information, check out my full review at CNET.com. Once again, this is Eric Franklin. This has been the first look at the Samsung SyncMaster P2450H. Yeah, I mean, this monitor looks a little wobbly, but with Eric punching him like that, what do you expect? He punched me once and I didn't get up again for like three days. No, I'm totally kidding. I'm kidding. Also, I can't wait to see that new Scott Pilgrim movie. Let's turn our attention to happier thoughts, shall we? Like this week's bottom line. I guess there's no point in avoiding it. We've got to take one more look at Steve Jobs' iPhone 4 announcement. Now, at events like the WWDC, Steve's demos frequently elicit cheers, applause, even audible gasps. But let's see what happens when things don't go quite as planned. All right. We're going to switch over to some backups here. I have a feeling we might have the same problem. primaries. I'm, I'm afraid uh, I have a problem and I'm not going to be able to show you much here today. I'll try one more time here. Boy, I'm sorry guys. I, uh, I don't know what's going on. Oh, here we go. Scott, you got any suggestions? We're actually on uh, we're actually on Wi-Fi here, so all right. Now, before I begin number six, I uh, our guys were running around like crazy backstage, as you might imagine, and we figured out why uh, my demo crashed. Because there are 570 Wi-Fi base stations operating in this room, okay? We can't deal with that. So we have two choices. Either I've got some more demos that are really great that I'd like to show you. So we either turn off all the stuff and see the demos, or we give up and I don't show you the demos. Would you like to see the demos or not? Okay. So here's the deal. Let's turn up the lights in the hall. Several hundred of these are these MiFi things too, by the way. So all you bloggers need to turn off your base stations, turn off your Wi-Fi, every notebook, I'd like them to put, put them down on the floor. And all of you look around, I'd like you to police each other. <laughs> if you want to see the demos, shut all your laptops, turn off all these MiFi base stations, and put them on the floor, please. The bottom line this week, hands off Steve Jobs' Wi-Fi. 
You know, when he asked everyone to put their laptops down, I felt like I was in elementary school and the whole class got in trouble and had to put their heads down on their desks. And just for the record, I was using 3G on my phone. Not my fault, Steve. And that's our show for this week, everyone. Tune in next week when we will have our complete coverage from the E3 video game show and a whole lot more. And in the meantime, get more great CNET video at CNETTV.com. See you next time, and thank you for watching.